Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming today to hear my presentation. As Dr. Lyle said, I'm Alexandra Kreitman. I'm the student lead investigator on the PITCH project. I also want to thank Dr. Sue Shapsis, who's right over there, uh, Dr. Li Hang Hao, Dr. Lauren Alex Sunez, and Yvette Lessel from Rutgers University for helping me prepare this presentation. Our title is Measuring Safety and Efficacy of a Health-Promoting Dietary Component, Monitoring GI Side Effects of a Putative Alpha-Glucosidase Inhibitor. So the problem that we're trying to solve is that vulnerable populations that are more susceptible to serious or non-serious gastrointestinal side effects are typically excluded from dietary efficacy, efficacy studies. And therefore, are we underestimating or misrepresenting the safety and efficacy of these products? So for example, a natural alpha-glucosidase inhibitor property that's in Salacia, known herb, has been previously tested for its efficacy as a botanical for reducing glycemic responses in overweight, obese, prediabetes, and diabetes populations. It's able to do this through the inhibition of pancreatic lipase, HMG-CoA reductase, and most importantly, alpha-glucosidase, which is found in the brush border of the small intestine, and it helps with the absorption of carbohydrates. We assume that when Slash is given, there's the occurrence of GI side effects, and therefore, individuals with a healthy GI tract are needed for compliance and test efficacy and individuals with GI disorders may have more side effects. These individuals with GI disorders are excluded in order to minimize self-reported adverse effects and dropouts, and if we wanted to include them in our dietary efficacy studies, other challenges would arise, such as it's difficult to identify patients with GI conditions, it's expensive to screen, and there's possibly more comorbidities in a population with GI conditions. To overcome these challenges, we could do the following. We could adjust exclusion and inclusion criteria. We can increase sample size for, to account for multiple comparisons and dropouts in the subgroup population. And we could create subject retention strategies by adding medication to alleviate GI side effects like simethicone. An example study design using Salacia could look like this. There would be a 10% difference in glycemic indices and a reduction in body weight, which has been found in animal studies prior to this one, in overweight, obese, pre-diabetics compared to placebo. In addition to the efficacy portion of the study, we would also proactively determine GI side effects in both general and susceptible subpopulation. The participants would be allocated in a two to one fashion into three groups, based on considering dropouts for typical reasons or to side effects. For example, healthy subjects with and without mild GI disorders would be randomized in a double-blind fashion through the three groups, placebo, 500 milligrams of salacia, or 1,000 milligrams of salacia. Now, each intervention would be given with a mixed meal breakfast, which would be composed of 50% carbohydrates, 30% fat, and 20% protein. Additionally, the salacia that would be given would be from the same lot number, from the same production line. There'd be no variability in activity, and it'd be picked from the same season. The study would take place over a three-month period, and at each monthly visit, weight, glucose, insulin, oral glucose tolerance tests, and hemoglobin A1C would be measured, in addition to adverse effects, focusing on the GI tract. And this could be measured through a survey specifically the GSRS, which is also known as the Gastrointestinal Symptom Rating Scale, which measures the severity of a symptom over a given week. And if adverse effects do occur, then over-the-counter medication could be provided in order to reduce dropouts. So again, we would want to measure glycemic indices, weight, and serious and non-serious adverse effects. Compliance would be measured through pill counting at monthly visits. And in collaboration with our statistician, we decided that ANOVA tests, post hoc analysis, and chi-square analysis would be used uh, on, this on this project. This new study design would include a population that is typically excluded from dietary efficacy studies. And therefore, success for us would look like the following. 
We know that Slatia over a long term may increase GI side effects in both populations and may even be greater with higher doses. And therefore, the optimal dose for Slatia would be the one with the most efficacy and the least amount of side effects in both those with and without GI, side, GI conditions. And therefore, the call to action is to establish entry criteria that include subjects in dietary efficacy studies, such as individuals with GI disorders. This is important because 22% of United States population suffer from digestive diseases. And therefore, including this population in efficacy studies would make the results more generalizable. Also, this would help physicians determine better treatments for participants or patients with GI conditions. And lastly, this approach overcomes hurdles that have been previously seen in alpha-glucosidase inhibitor research trials. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them at this time. Thank you. And to the judges. Could I just ask a, a question? You might have covered it, but I don't think so. Mm -hmm. What is salacia? So salacia is an herb, um, and it has multiple components. Um, for example, it has migladol, uh, salacinol, if I pronounce those correctly. Um, and they all contribute a different property to the herb. So there are multiple factors that salacia could be involved in. And specifically, we studied its effect on glycemic response. Is it currently used in, for this indication, and is it in the marketplace? So my dad has um, diabetes. He's had it for five years, so I was very interested in the, in the herb itself, and so was he. Um, and I actually did a little research, and I found that glimipiride contains salicia in its co composition, um, which is a medication for diabetics. So it possibly is used, yes. With the additional subgroup, how much more did the number of subjects or you know, what percent had to so as a, as a So as a hypothetical um, numbers that we came up with, uh, it was that, let's say we had 30 for the placebo group, we would want a two to one ratio. So it'd be 70 in the 500 milligram group if we use that dose and 70 in the 1,000 milligram group. I've had some interest in these diseases. Um, mm -hmm. I've got some friends who suffer them. Yes. But it's a it's a very broad number of GI I mean all the way to you know mm -hmm. irritable bowel to ulcerative colitis. I mean, how, how are you dealing with? I mean, the inclusion and exclusion of already quite sick people. Correct. So I myself suffer from irritable bowel syndrome. So that's why I was so interested in using them as a subgroup population. Um, but what we discovered is that because IBS ranges from such a severity, from mild to severe, and in addition to celiac disease and other GI conditions, we would primarily want to focus on mild GI disorders like lactose intolerant, gastritis, things that are mild, and then can, we could go from there eventually, but just focus on mild GI disorders at this point. And have you, have you, will you address with the patients um, their, their, um, are they taking any other sources of it that you might not know? Or you, have you checked into that in the subjects in the study? Meaning other medications? Other Sorry. things that may be other sources of this herb. Um, are, other, there, are there other, other mixtures on the market that they, they might be getting a bigger dose than what you think you're giving them, the 500 and 1,000? Meaning have people used over 1,000 of salacia before? Yeah. Um, so this, uh, this herb, um, the most studies that have, they've done is the highest amount they've used is 1,000. They haven't gone beyond that. So if uh, medications are using them or other herbal remedies are using salacia as part of it, none of them really, really gone over 1,000. And they've shown no toxicity as a result of that so far. So, and, and final question. Um, <laughs> Are there, are there people who aren't sick at all among your, your subjects, I mean, in the different groups, or are they all need to be treated? For using, like a, a using, diabetic. Using this, yeah. So for here, we would want to use um, pre-diabetics, um, as Salisha um, would help with those patients. But as I just, I'll show you. So this is the poster that's hanging um, in the other room right over there. Um, and these patients, um, only a few of them were pre-diabetic um, based on categorizing them, but a majority of them weren't. So this study was just looking at an overweight, obese population. 
So, and we saw similar results as what would happen with a pre-diabetic. So what, what, you're, what you're doing here, I mean, there's, I think you started out with, a lot of these people would have been excluded from the study, like we exclude so many, we just want normals in Correct. studies. So you're including the people who may need this the most. You're people who someone. would be excluded, typically. Yeah. They're usually excluded. Yes. Thank you. <laughs>